Please stand for the prayer of illumination in the scripture. God, source of all light, by your word you give light to the soul. Pour out on us the spirit of wisdom and understanding that our hearts and minds may be opened. Amen. Our scripture this morning is from 2 Samuel, beginning at verse 5. The king commanded Joab, Abishai, and Ittai, Be gentle with the young man Absalom for my sake. And all the troops heard the king giving orders concerning Absalom to each of the commanders. David's army marched out of the city to fight Israel, and the battle took place in the forest of Ephraim. There, Israel's troops were routed by David's men, and the casualties that day were great, 20,000 men. The battle spread out over the whole countryside, and the forest swallowed up more men that day than the sword. Now Absalom happened to meet David's men. He was riding his mule, and as the mule went under the thick branches of a large oak, Absalom's hair got caught in the tree. He was left hanging in midair while the mule he was riding kept on going. And ten of Joab's armor bearers surrounded Absalom, struck him, and killed him. Then the Cushite arrived and said, My lord the king, hear the good news. The Lord has vindicated you today by delivering you from the hand of all who rose up against you. The king asked the Cushite, Is the young man Absalom safe? The Cushai replied, May the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up to harm you be like that young man. The king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and wept. As he went, he said, O my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. O Absalom, my son, my son. The word of God for the people of God. That's what I wanted to say after that praise the Lord our God Almighty. That's pretty amazing. In fact, I've been known to run with a few Cajuns before. Y'all know any Cajuns out down around here? When I was going to Southern Methodist, we had a couple of Louisiana brothers from down in the bayou. One of them being a Methodist, he went by the name of Reverend PQ. Reverend PQ was his name. And he had a friend who was Roman Catholic priest, and he was Father Beauregard. Reverend PQ and Father Beauregard decided to get together and pray about their town. Now, y'all know this is a joke because it's a Methodist and a Catholic praying together, right? Okay, so, yeah, that can't be happening, right? Well, they get together, and they start praying, what are we going to do about our community down on the parish? It's not Mardi Gras, out of control, floods, hurricanes. If y'all can't understand me, it's because I'm speaking Cajun, all right? <laughs> but they get to visit, and they get to pray, and Reverend PQ, being of sound mind and Wesleyan theology, says, I think we should take action and develop some signs to put out. Go out and tell the people all about what they need to do. The Father Beauregard agreed. Next morning, they get together for coffee, and they got out poster board, and they're writing on it best that they know how to write with their best penmanship and they get out some sticks and they they staple them together and they go out alongside the highway here comes an old pickup truck windows rolled down early in the morning they hold up the sign the end is near the end is near tone back tone back which the old farmer with his windows rolled down, stuck out his head. You crazy religious nuts, get off my highway! A few seconds later, you hear brakes locking down. <coughs> you just hear the crash and the crumble of metal crunching in the background. They shake the hand. Mm, mm, we gotta try harder. Uh-huh, uh-huh, try harder next time. So here comes a fast sports car. <coughs> And they get put up their signs, and they're both yelling this time, The end is near! The end is near! Come back now! Come back now before it's too late! This went on the third time, and 
The gentleman stuck his hand out the window and told them that they were number one, and the priest, he didn't even know what that meant, but the Methodist, <laughs> Reverend PQ knew what that was, and he was like, oh, how vile they can be, the people, the people, and they were just lamenting, and then they started, we should pray about this, and they started praying about it, and you know what they decided? Maybe we should have a different sign. Maybe we should put on the sign, the bridge is out. <laughs> Communication is tough, right? <laughs> Communication's hard. It's sometimes hard to get that message. It's sometimes hard to receive that. But it's really about us communicating with God and God communicating with us and paying attention. Paying attention is what Jesus was all about. He said that in his earliest first sermon, I wish that preachers nowadays could do this. Mark 1, verse 15, Jesus' first sermon. Hear the good news, repent and believe. You know why I have to keep preaching at you? I'm not Jesus. All right, so the sermons are a little longer, but the message is still the same. Pay attention. Oh, my son, Absalom. Absalom, my son, my son, if it would only have been me instead of you, my son, Absalom. Oh, my son. Five times in one verse, we hear David's lament about his son. Because it's truly a lament for his son, but also him as a father. Because David failed to pay attention. Oh, such a sad story. You could go back to 2 Samuel chapter 11 and pick up where did it all go wrong, but... Before that, things were going well. Y'all know David. He took down a Philistine. What was that guy's name? Goliath. Yeah, man, I mean, things were going right. So he took down the Philistines. Then David went after the Amorites and the Edomites and the Moabites. The only people he couldn't get rid of were the termites. I mean, this guy was with God, all right? And he was winning everywhere with the sword. Nation of Israel would never be bigger than under King David's rule. But while he was a warrior king, he also became a womanizer. Did y'all know that about David? We should never pay to watch a movie again. Everything that they put on screen came right out of the Bible, folks. 2 Samuel 11. When the kings went off in the spring to make war, David stayed behind. You know what David did, though, instead of going to make war? He went on the top of his palace. And he looked down there and he saw a Swedish bikini girl named Bathsheba in her hot tub. And he said, I want that, right? And then it just led to one thing after another, trouble after trouble. He laments the loss of that child much less than he does the loss of Absalom. Why? Because he was charged to watch Absalom grow up, to rear him, to nurture him. But that did not take place at the same level that it should have. In other words, Absalom was the third son to the third wife at that point in the narrative. Now tradition and some of the scriptures will allude, y'all know he has another son that builds a temple, right? What's the smart guy's name? Was he really all that wise? He had a bunch of concubines and wives. I question his wisdom. But yes, and so more than at least ten sons, <laughs> countless daughters, but Absalom third son of the third wife, he had two other brothers and at least one sister. The oldest brother's name was Abnom. And Abnom's mother was quite a looker, according to the scripture, and so his sister, Abnom's sister, this would be David's half-brother and half-sister, Tamar, she was a looker as well. Now, they're in Jerusalem. That's a city on the hill. Judea is known for its hilly nature, why do we not think that these people are hillbillies? You ever wonder that? They are. The people of faith are from the hill country. Amnon has a crush, it's described as lust, for his sister Tamar. Is it making more sense now that they're hillbillies? Yeah, to the point that he goes and tells all the staff at the royal palace, I call this palatial pandemonium, that... He's sick at his stomach, have Tamar come in and take care of him. When she does that, kind of like on a movie, she's like, now, now Amnon, I know you like me. You just stay over there. Don't bother me. Stay away. You, otherwise, you'll make us to be like the other people to the east. That's what we say in Oklahoma, right? 
Okay. Well, he's like, no, I can't help myself. And he sexually assaults, violates his own sister. Can you, right there in David's court at his house of residency. Where's David at? I don't know. Story doesn't tell us, but he's obviously not paying attention. Well, Absalom gets that message. And Absalom's not someone to mess around with. Not only does he go out riding on a mule, but according to Scripture, he's got hair that he only gets cut once a year. So he's kind of like David Hasselhoff, Fabio, you know, one of those broad shoulders. It says there was no other man more handsome in all the land than Absalom. They have to weigh his hair. It's so heavy and magnificent. I'll show you what it looks like. You know why that didn't work for me? This last week, I go and sit down in the barber's chair, and he starts talking. He says, well, I know Kenny. I know Freddie over at your church, and he's, he's a Baptist. I had this great hair, and look what he did to it. Took it all off. I'm praying for Brian across the street. But uh, the truth of the matter is, is that Absalom was an egomaniac in the Scriptures. But when he hears what his brother Abnon had done to his sister Tamar and how he got mad about it and cast her out and didn't make it right, Absalom says, let's go on a little field trip. And he has the elders of the tribes overtake and orders them to kill his own brother. You can't make this stuff up, can you? It's amazing what's in Scripture. I mean, I should just close and say, to be continued next week. Right? That's how it feels in the climax of this whole thing. But he goes on, and uh, that obviously upsets his dad enough to where he's like, what's going on at my house? Oh, well, your kids are involved in incest. Your youngest son just murdered your oldest son. Things are bad, David. Wake up, right? Well, David gets angry. Absalom does what any young man would do, and he runs off, and he's gone for three years. And over that three-year period of time, because Absalom was David's favorite child at that point, he starts saying, well, let's send word to have Absalom come back home. So here he comes. And you know what you do when a kid returns home that's been acting like that? Buy him a new car. All right, that's, that's what you do. We had two boys. We made sure they were, one was a trumpeter, one was a saxophone. We had to try to help them. We had them some Mustang convertibles. The oldest one would put down the top and listen to Mozart. Is that, is that how you pick up girls, listen to Mozart? I'd ask him that, son. Are the girls just crazy about Mozart? <laughs> the youngest one, more coy than his little brother, he'd put down the top on his convertible driving around, and he'd listen to Frank Sinatra. He, he was, we're getting better, all right? We're getting better. Well, Absalom, with all of his hair, he gets him a chariot. And you think, hey, that's only the pastor's kids. Just two days ago, I'm sitting out in the backyard, and I hear... Bump, 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 and some Mexican trumpets, and this kid comes around, some beat-up old Ford pickup around the reservoir, and he's got uh, 22s on it, and it's squeaking and dragging, and, and I go out there, and I'm like, all hell Cesar, right? You know, I mean, he was, he was king of his castle. Absalom, no different. Gets him a chariot. Those have like 35s on them. Goes out riding around, got 50 men that go out, and they play horns for him. They tell everybody, here he comes, and he goes to the city gate. That's like coming into town. And everybody who comes to town, they say, go before Absalom. And he judges so gently with them. And, oh, what do you need? I love you. Oh, come on in. And it says that he won the hearts of the people. So much to the point that, guess what they start saying? All hail King Absalom. Who's the king? Is he now? Well, that kind of got his hackles up. But he couldn't do much about it. Absalom moved over to Hebron. Got more people to follow him. You know, it's just kind of one of those things, who's bigger, who's badder type deal. And you know that eventually there's going to be a conflict. Absalom comes back home to Jerusalem. David gets word that he's on his way because of some priests and some other officers. He heads out beyond the Jordan with his people, going up the Mount of Olives of all places, right where David's tomb is to this day, barefoot with his head covered with the ark of the Lord, lamenting if he will ever be back in his palace in the Mount Zion. Y'all know who came down the Mount of Olives right before Easter? Y'all ever show up at Palm Sunday? I know you have to skip that one because next week you're expected to be here. 
because it's Easter? What, what do us kids say when we bring in the palm branches? Hosanna! Hosanna! I'm trying to give you a head start. I'm working with your choir to help them help us, okay? And they say, blessed is what? He who comes in the name of the Lord. They thought Jesus was like King David, didn't they? But David is going up the Mount of Olives, past the Jordan, back into the wilderness, which God would use for his gain. More were lost in the wilderness that day than to the sword. The place where the people had found them exiled, now their king was there, but he would return home victoriously. But how it got there is out of control. That kid that was hair on wheels, you know the one I'm talking about, Absalom, out there riding around, currying favor. It says that the king David, before they went out to battle and he was not allowed to, gave an order to all the king's commanders, no doubt that they would not know the order. Be gentle with the young man Absalom. They all heard it on their ear. You know what they were thinking in their mind? This kid has overthrown you, David. This kid is out to get your kingdom. Are you crazy? And was David crazy? A little bit. He was crazy not to pay attention. And so when they went out and they experienced this victory, one soldier returned saying, I saw Absalom. He was hanging not on the earth and not in the heavens, but in between. His hair was caught in an oak tree. I call that put a stick in it. He's done, right? He's almost gone. It's this crazy vision of a mule riding off and Absalom going, Oh, look at me. Look at my flowing hair. I'm such big stuff. And then all of a sudden, uh-oh. What went wrong? It's a warning to all of us that we can't live in between. We can't be king and we can't be servant. We can't be leader and we can't be follower, one of the other. And if we're going to follow God, we're going to have to pay attention and submit to his orders in our life, his decree. Absalom was not that man. When he returns, and we picked up with the Joab's armor bearers attacking him and finishing him off. But honestly, before that, I'd tell you that Joab thrust three spears into Absalom's heart. They gave him a proper burial. They put stones over his grave out there in the battlefield. They honored him, but they were glad he was gone. But when the word got back to the king, who happened to be the father, the lamentations must have been heard all over Jerusalem. Oh, my son, my son Absalom. Oh, it would have been better for me to have died than you. My son Absalom. Oh, my son. But whose fault was it that Absalom turned out that way? Paying attention. A rebellious spirit. I like what Walter Brueggemeyer says. He said, more than just someone hanging by their hair in an oak tree, this is representative of how we are suspended between life and death, being that of a rebellious rouser and that of a beloved son, suspended between the enemy and that of a charitable father. Yes, it is the way for us to come back. Jesus himself had a spear plunged into his side, and the blood and the water flowed out. But Jesus didn't get his head stuck up there. Jesus chose that cross. What Paul said in Romans 5, This proves God's love to us, for while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. It was a choice so that we wouldn't be caught in this suspension. So we could choose to pay attention, to repent, to turn away, and to get back on that path of righteousness. Because even in all of this, David would be known as a man after God's heart. It's available to all of us this very moment. I like Jesus' words even though they are hard. Y'all ever notice that? People complain about the preacher. But just read Jesus' words. That's why I say, what Jesus say? That's worse than the preachers, right? Matthew 7, verse 13. Enter the narrow gate. For the gate is is wide and broad is the road that leads to destructions and many have followed it 
That's like an eight-lane highway out there, right? The world that we can get caught up in. But he says, rather, enter the small gate, for it is narrow, but it leads to life, and few have found their way to it. We are people of a narrow way. But the world has gone broad. Even here in Altus, America, and I'll give you a perfect example. Just happened this last week. The first Jackson County Ministerial Alliance meeting that had been summoned for the beginning of a school semester. I show up, they say, be down there at 8 o'clock for prayer for all of our leaders. Five of us showed up. One was Reverend PQ and Father Beauregard, okay? <laughs> Five of us showed up. You want to know how many showed up for the business meeting one hour later? Twenty-five. We're pretty good at doing business. We're pretty good at looking out on each other. And I've been surveying the land a little bit, seeing what's going on, and talking to one of the pastors. He said, well, y'all got something good going on over there. I said, yeah, we serve a good God. And I said, they're pretty excited. We've been having a couple of hundred a Sunday. And he's like, 200 a Sunday? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, well, how many they got over at First Baptist? And I said, well, I don't know. So this morning, Jenny and I went over. Do you all know our building is taller than theirs? Thanks be to God, right? So like Absalom up there in the tree, I just looked around a little while. And I told the ushers, the ushers, they can keep count. They've been looking out there and they've been counting Baptist char cars versus Methodist cars, and, and we're winning, people. I've been having everybody that's got a car park their car up here so we can have more. We kind of get in that way, don't we? So we did a little thing and said, Reuben over at another church, I said, how many people you think are in church in Altus on a Sunday? And the best that we can recollect with all of us together, 675 churches or however many people there are here in town, because you've got to have a church for everybody, right? We figure there's about 3,000 people in town in church on a Sunday morning. Y'all have any dispute for that? Y'all know y'all are like the second largest church in town, right? Well, that ain't good enough. We're going for largest, all right? But there's 20,000 people in Altus, not counting Elmer and what's that other, Alusty and oh, Navajo and Duke and Hollis. And I'd take one of those, what's that, Wellington? We'd take a Texan over here if we had to, all right? But 20,000 people right here in our city, do the math on that, that means like 85% of people need to be here and the end is near. You know what I'm saying? Turn around, repent. We have some work to do. We cannot be like David and just assume all is right because God was with us in this season and he will always be with us. We affirm that. We have to pay attention to what's going on in our own households, in our own businesses, in our own community. And I'm telling you, people are going down the broad way. Don't we have a town called Broadway, a street called Broadway here? Yeah, it runs east and west, right? People are not on the narrow path. And it's been happening all across our land and our country for over 50 years. I'm going to tell you that in 1968, y'all went from being, what's, what's above the doors out here? Y'all know what it says that the Baptists have to read? Methodist Episcopal South. Methodist Episcopal South, that's right. We're the people of the hill country, right? They have to read that every time they walk across. You know what we did in 1968? Put another sign out there, and what does it say? United Methodists. And you know what's been happening to our worship attendance since 1968 as a denomination? Downhill skiing is what I call it. I mean, it's nothing but plummeted. So for 50 years, more than 40 out in the wilderness, for 50 years the Methodist people have been declining. Do y'all like seeing kids in church? I like those little rebel rousers. I want some of them to have long hair and start riding mules around here, okay? <laughs> Keep our attention. But what I like more than little ones or old ones is all of them. That's what a Cajun would say, right? All of these people that are in our community are God's children, and we have to pay attention to how to get them plugged in. I think you got the right stuff. I think you know what it takes. It's not just a story for the past. It speaks to us in the present. When I read the Old Testament, I'm like, well, that's a reality TV show. More people ought to be reading this, right? They ought to be getting into it. 
but they don't even know about it. See, the more things change, the more they remain the same. There's a season and a time for every activity under heaven. That was written by one of David's boys. Solomon's given credit for that. We're here to teach, we're here to preach, we're here to proclaim, but what we are here to do is to take the good news of Jesus Christ out there. Who has God been telling you to pay attention to? Let us pray. Lord, I lament. I lament for the loss of Absalom, but I relent for, relent for, and lament for the re loss of Amnon as well. And for a young child who was born but not allowed to breathe because of a relationship that was not done well in your sight. Man, oh, King David. Why could he not pay attention to his own affairs? Well, Lord, because of King David, you had your hand upon him. You showed people how and whom he served. And we are still talking about him today. But how difficult it is to go in that narrow gate. It's like we walk right past it and say, I don't know. But you said, if anyone wants to follow me, you must deny yourself. Take up your own oak tree, a cross, and follow me. Lord, we humble ourselves in your presence. Ask you to help us to examine our own hearts, to be made aware of the things that we need to address at home so that we can be more effective out there in Altus. And we're excited about where the Spirit's leading and where you're taking us. But help us not to have our noses up in the air so that we might avoid being stuck in an oak tree, but to keep our feet firmly on the rock and our heart firmly upon your role. We ask this in the mighty name of Christ Jesus our Lord. And the people said,